And welcome into the Pocket Miami Community Radio. I'm your host, Goon Green. Thanks so much for uh, tuning in live with us to everyone that's on mcr.watch. As always, feel free to peruse the website to check out some of our residents. We do need to update with some of the newer residents, so you can check out our Instagram to stay really up to date. That's Miami Community Radio on Instagram, uh, as well as YouTube. Uh, you can check out all the archives, like the performance from just a moment ago, as well as this... Uh, uh, in the moment, in the future, but <laughs> soon to be in the past interview. Uh, well, not really an interview, but more so just a, a conversation between us that I've been I've been looking forward to for a while. We'll all be on the YouTube channel, Miami Community Radio, which you can subscribe to. You can check out um, all of uh, the past programs as well. So, and again, thank you so much to Isaac Diskin, and thanks so much to the Miami Community Radio team for uh, allowing this to happen. Uh, and thank you as well to uh, the Space Shotgun uh, and Concreta Sala for allowing this to happen as well. It's so beautiful to be able to uh, share live music and share these different um, uh, ideas, concepts from various individuals within the community, especially in such an open forum where there's no restrictions on, on what can be said or what can be uh, sent out to the public, being, that's, being that it's an internet radio station. So with all that said, I welcome back Matt Tufaro. Thanks so much for, for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and thanks uh, for sharing all that music. Really incredible to to listen to it. Like you said, we played it in the trio um, yeah. for for a little while, which was an amazing experience. So, yeah. and, and we'll we'll reconvene when the time's right. Mm -hmm. um, but it was amazing as well to to hear it in the solo context, you know, which mm -hmm. I don't think I'd ever heard it live I mean, outside of the times where you present. You know, you right. played it for us. <laughs> um, but the original time when you played it all was all. You know, for your, for your senior recital with all those, oh, right. incredible, absolutely incredible cast of musicians. That was a masterful performance as well. But, um, yeah, really incredible. Um, I, I do want to ask, though, because I like to ask everyone um, from the beginning, kind of, like, what, what's your origin in the music, basically? How did you come to be a player? How did you come to be so passionate about music that it, you know, is such a large part of your identity? Like, w how do you feel like that story kind of developed for you? Yeah. Um, so it all started when I was, like, eight years old. My dad uh, played guitar, and he, he just had a couple around, and he would, like, he showed me some, some basic stuff. Um, some bar chords, and then I took to it, and they, I think later that year, I played uh, Blackbird by the Beatles in my elementary school talent show. Nice. And, you know, that first taste of the stage, I was just like, <laughs> had to have it. <laughs> From then on, I knew. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. And you were writing from pretty young, too, right? You were composing yeah. from, like, high school age? Uh, so... Yeah, so I actually started writing when I was like 11. Oh, so even younger then. Yeah, wow. um, but you know, they were like like pop punk kind of compositions. For sure. And um, you know, they developed more and more. And then, yeah, in high school, I think that's when my uh, compositional style really kind of started to emerge. Right. And, and did you, were you writing only for yourself at that time or were you presenting it? Were you performing anywhere? Like yeah. what was your, what was your process at that time? Um, so... So I was writing for, like, my, myself, but also I had some bands that I was in. Um, so then I was, I was writing in that context as well, um, in a more collaborative setting. Um, and, yeah. For sure, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did you, you know, outside of the instruction that you had from your dad early on, did you have, like, did you study privately at that time, or were you more so self-taught, or how did that all develop yeah so so the first like three years um I, I i did have a private teacher and then as i got into middle school i kind of kind of i guess I, I didn't put guitar down but i like put it on the back burner a little bit and i started playing cello actually for, oh, nice. for, like, oh i think we've years. talked about this yeah. actually yeah nice <laughs> um so so then i did that um you know i didn't stay away from guitar for too long and <laughs> uh then a lot of my guitar stuff was like self-taught up until maybe um, junior year of high school when I was in jazz band. Right. And, um, you know, then I got, that was like my first kind of introduction to jazz. I remember hearing Chick Corea for the first time and 
you know. Pretty mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rest in peace, of course. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So then at that time you got into jazz mm -hmm. and um, how did, how did it develop to this current moment where like, how did you find your sound? I guess the sound yeah. of the performance that we just heard, like, are there any particular influences? Like what was your earlier stuff? Like, was it, right. was it really just like pop punky or were you getting mm -hmm. into more like, yeah, just how the development of it came for you to, cause it's very like, you know, this is not music that like anyone and their mother could write. Like it's pretty, <laughs> it's very like heady, but it's also at the same time, it's pure in a way that I feel like a lot of like math rock isn't. And I feel mm. like why a lot of people don't like math rock is cause it's like, I mean, it's in the name, it's math, you know what yeah. I mean? Like it's, it's not so much. You got to pull out your calculator in the mosh <laughs> exactly. pit. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time though, I, I've been thinking about this recently. Well, I've been thinking about it really for a while, but more recently it hit me in a different kind of way of just, just the relationship between music and math and how mm -hmm. I feel like music is a perfect balance between, you know, the kind of like mathematical fundamentals of the universe. Like just mm -hmm. everything that makes up the universe is kind of reflected in music. Yeah. yeah but then it's yeah. also such a beautiful form of like, human expression in this kind of like ineffable, you know, intangible way. So it's like, right. it is the math, it's the physics of it all. It's the sound waves. It's all this different stuff, mm -hmm. but then it's also like the expression. So to connect that to your stuff, I feel like you just meet that balance really well between like the lyrical content, the message of the songs, also like the harmony that you're incorporating and, and just the, just the compositions really, frankly, I just, they just kind of, touch me in a certain type of way that I feel like isn't, and I, to be fair, I haven't delved incredibly deeply into the genre, but I just feel like I don't generally experience that, like with stuff yeah. that's as complex as that. So yeah, I guess I'm just curious, like if that was a super active choice to try mm -hmm. to like bring together these two different worlds or if it was just, you know, you and it just worked that way or yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, thank you. Like, holy shit, that was, <laughs> that was a really, really big compliment. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so I think, I think for, for a certain point, especially in high school, like, I was super into metal and progressive metal. And, you know, because I was kind of teaching myself at least guitar at that point, um, I, I really kind of just threw myself into technicality, learning theory, and, and doing as many crazy techniques as I could. So there was a time where all my compositional choices weren't maybe the most musical. <laughs> but Yeah, I've been there too. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I think a as that developed, you know, I, I mean, I, first off, I still love metal. Um, but, you know, as I started, like, getting into theory and harmony a lot more, you know, there's like a lot of like crazy like jazz chords and like extended kind of voicings that you can't really do with distortion. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. so naturally, you know, I just started to turn the gain down <laughs> more yeah, and more. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then of course, you know, um, going to, going to school for, for jazz guitar, like one of my main focuses really was harmony and, and like building chords and just like having all these different sounds coalescing at, at one point in time. So, um, so I think uh, that's, that's where some of the technical aspect came from. Um, but then I think, you know, despite, despite like really being all about technique at a certain point, I, I, I did try to keep it musical still. Right. Um, you know, I still like, I mean, uh, you know, the Beatles, like my, my, my parents were super into that. Nice. Um, and, and I like different types of pop music. I like R&B. I mean, I like pretty much anything. Like, For so, sure. so I, I, I do try to keep an element of accessibility and, and a kind of aesthetic that you don't have to do math to, right. <laughs> to, to relate right. to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I try to prioritize for that first. Like, even with some of these compositions, they've gone through phases where um, they were maybe more complex at a certain point. And, um, you know, my, my teacher at school, John Hart, was, like, like, would, you know, give me feedback and 
would kind of, you know, make me always prioritize like serving the song. Hmm. Um, and so, so yeah, so I still try to do that. There's a couple of those songs where they're all in one time signature, you know, so. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> a rare, yeah. a rare occurrence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, the influence that you, that you drew from your, your parents in terms of music yeah. and everything. So was it, were you very supported in your musical endeavors? Like, did you feel like, like, did you feel like it was something kind of, like, is it something in your family where there's a precedent for it? Or do you conceive yourself as like a black sheep in that sense? Uh, no, not really, because, you know, my dad's a, a great guitar player. My mom is a great singer. Nice, nice, um, cool. My uncle is a great piano player. Oh, wow. Um, so it's really in the family then. Nice, yeah, nice. yeah, there's there's quite a few musicians. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So how did it come to be that you found yourself at, at Frost? Um, well, so there's a long version. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> condensed, uh, after high school, I went hitchhiking. Right, I was going to ask about yeah. that as well. You can just speak on that experience now, because that was oh, also oh, one sure. of my points, but yeah. Well, well, to quickly tie it back into how, why I started my frost journey right, with, right. with hitchhiking, is <laughs> because I, I uh, went to, I, I ended up in Boston, I made friends there, and I uh, moved into a house with a bunch of people. One of them was a Berkeley student who encouraged me to audition, and uh, I... I, I kind of fucked up when I, because <laughs> I applied for the summer semester because I was uh, like, oh, it's cheaper. And then apparently they don't give scholarships for it. Uh, <laughs> so, so they get you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they they were like, you know, we have a couple like community colleges that uh, have like accredited, like you, you can transfer from there. Right. And one of them was Miami Dade. And then when I, so I moved to Miami to go to Dade, and then... Uh, you had never been in Florida before, right? Or you had oh, been no, here from before? St. Pete. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so you grew up there, lived there your whole life yeah. until until you went hitchhiking, basically, when exactly. you were Exactly, yeah. Right. Um, I had never been to Miami, though, right. <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah, it's a different world, for sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, then just going to MDC and kind of getting connected with, like, the scene here and the people here. I had a really great teacher, Aaron Libos, who... Yeah. Uh, yeah, incredible. Amazing player. Yeah. yeah. Plays a lot around town if anyone wants to check around his stuff. Yeah. I think like Abstract Citizen or something. Yes. And yeah, with, like that's... Justine and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's incredible and really, you know, um, helped me kind of get a meeting with John Hart so that mm. I could talk to him and then and then went to Frost that way. Right. But yeah. you were doing a, a comp degree, right? As well as a performance degree or, or was it... So I minored in composition. Right, that's right, yeah, that's right, yeah. that's right, that's right, that's uh, right. But the main degree is like jazz, guitar, performance. That's what it says. Right. Yeah, we were in the same, yeah, yeah, same, yeah. same program. Yeah, that <laughs> was interesting for sure. Yeah. Um, so speaking about the the hitchhiking experience, then mm -hmm. which you alluded to, what? Because that's something from when we first connected that was just so striking to me. I had mm. never met anyone that had an experience like that. Um, so it was very, and it is just very striking in a certain type of way. I've definitely like pondered that a lot and, and spoken about it and it's something that I would love to like a, a period in my life that I would love if it manifested as yeah, well yeah, at definitely. some point maybe probably not super soon but mm -hmm. um, anyway so yeah like how did that how did that come to be basically yeah, yeah. Uh, so so in high school I was super into like Henry Thoreau mm. and uh, Jack Kerouac so mm. uh, I read Walden and then I read On the Road and, you know, I, I kind of wanted to explore living, like, a, a minimalist. Not that hitchhiking is necessarily minimalist, but, um, you know, I, I wanted to explore some of the ph philosophical concepts in Thoreau and some of my own things. And uh, then reading on the road, I was like, oh, shit, I could do it <laughs> <laughs> this way. <laughs> this is one way to do that. Um, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, the, the main kind of force that was driving me was the the idea that like I mean this this goes a, a little bit back to what you were saying about like how music really is like I guess displaying or showcasing the the math just in the universe mm -hmm. and in trying to look for some sort of similar essential underlying thing that I could I guess characterize the universe by um, I realized like the only thing that was really like constant throughout that was was impermanence was the fact that everything was changing and so mm -hmm. 
I feel like, you know, we, we often go through life like really trying to make things last, understandably so. <laughs> um, and and my, my idea was, well, maybe I might be living a little bit more kind of in, I guess, kind of in, in harmony with the universe, so to speak, mm. if I am going with the flow, if I'm embracing that change, I'm not trying to, to stop it from happening, but um, literally centering my life around being in constant motion. So, right. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and from what you just said, it seems like you didn't necessarily set an intention, uh, mm-hmm. but that the intention was, was to be open towards change. But yeah. did you feel, was the experience surprising in any ways? Like, did you feel as though it manifested how you would have expected or were there anything that you know threw you for a loop or any like particularly interesting experiences throughout that whole period of your life yeah yeah definitely um yeah there's a lot of things you know it's hard to say like how much how how many expectations I really had because you know if I'm like oh I'm gonna go hitchhiking it's like you you really don't know what's gonna happen (laughs) so so yeah there was definitely an element of just it sort of being open um but i think you know some of the most interesting things that did happen were well i didn't realize how how much of a social thing it was going to be like i kind of figured like i would be doing a lot of like all right i'll hitchhike and then i'll go camping there's going to be a lot of like inward sort of reflection and 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 there was but um you know, you're obviously somebody needs to be driving the car to pick <laughs> you up. So, so there's really so many times where you're you're never really alone. There's always somebody there, and, right. and so there's a lot of like really just incredible connections and amazing people that I met wow. doing that. That um, not that I didn't expect that to happen, but I didn't realize like how much that was going to be right. Right. The the main kind of kind of one of the most memorable aspects. Wow. Um, so yeah. Yeah. The other most memorable aspect was train hopping. So not <laughs> hitchhiking at all, but hopping on freight trains. Uh, it's cool as fuck. Is there a trick to it, or just while it's going slow, just get uh, up there? Yeah, or wait for it to stop. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. You ever like almost get caught by a conductor or something? Uh yeah. <laughs> 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 there was a so. I think one of the funniest things is like, all right, so there, <laughs> this is maybe a little incriminating, but like, <laughs> they have these, like, like, like the, con- the, the, the car that the conductor sits in. Right. I, I guess that's like where the engine is. Right. And so if they're going through mountains, they'll maybe have them also in the middle and maybe at the end to help push up oh, the mountain. Oh, I see. Right. That's right, the reason right. I'm told. I never really looked it up, but right, <laughs> yeah. it makes but, sense. Yeah. 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 So I, um, you know, sometimes if you can hop, hop on one of the back, uh, cars, mm. you can get like a really nice ride. It's, it's great if it's snowing, mm. you know, and th- it's really, <laughs> it's really cold on a train. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with, <laughs> with the wind and everything and um so so if it's if it's snowing or something like that um you know you can ride in the back of the car and like the engine cars you're talking about or yeah yeah and there's like you know the conductor chairs and there's a bathroom it's it's, but there's no one there yeah well ideally so (laughs) then (laughs) um (laughs) so then there was this one time where um my good friend chris and i we were like uh some 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 stuff went down like in in the train yard like there were some sketchy people and like we had to start running and getting out of there and we were just like fuck it let's just jump on a train like we don't know where it's going but like right. you know we can only run for so long with like backpacks yeah. and, and stuff yeah. so we saw a conductor car and mm. we were like i think this track is supposed to go like south and if that's the case then you know like we should be on the back like if it's exiting from here um and we were wrong (laughs) and so we were like you know we 
we didn't know if we had been spotted, so we mm -hmm. like stayed in the bathroom. We're like, let's just wait it out for a few minutes, like until it starts moving, and we know we're safe. Um, and then somebody came on, and we like heard them from the bathroom, and we were like, okay, maybe it's just an inspection. <laughs> like, <laughs> hopefully they leave in a second. And and then the train started to leave, and we were like, oh fuck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we're in the conductor's chair. We're, we're, we're in their bathroom. In their bathroom. So, um, <laughs> they did not, I guess they just didn't have to go. They didn't the go? Entire wow. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> Which was crazy because, you know, if they did open the door, they would have just shit their pants. Like, <laughs> just like two, two, like, you know, like 19 year olds, like, just like really cramped. Yeah. Like, backpacks and everything like one leg up here you know like would have like fallen out of wow. their bathroom and uh that would have been really funny yeah but uh wow. but yeah no that didn't happen so so eventually once it stopped they they did see us getting off because we were kind of mm -hmm. like cautious because we were like what if it stopped in the middle of nowhere like for they have to wait for another train or right. we don't want to like yeah have to walk yeah. at, who, who knows how long yeah, yeah um, for real and so they did spot us as we were getting off but we just ran <laughs> for <laughs> so, sure. so it was nice. all good i mean you're good at that point yeah yeah wow do you know how like approximately how long the ride was i think it was like six hours six to eight hours that's a lot yeah. <laughs> that's so a it was, long ride yeah, it, was, <laughs> wow. it was pretty bad <laughs> wow wow amazing yeah thanks yeah. for sharing that Appreciate yeah it. so how did it uh, was there like a specific cutoff point that you were like, all right, this is when I stop or did it like, how did, how do you f find your way out of it? Out um, of that lifestyle? Yeah. Uh, well, I think there, there became a point where like I wasn't really experiencing new things. It was like a bit of a, you're just like, you know, like just walking Right, 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 right. And right. the backpack's really heavy. Like a different skin for the same experience. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And like, you know, <laughs> And you're just kind of trudging along and like, you know, I don't know, you know, not as much cool or exciting stuff is happening. And, and especially like, you know, when I was hitchhiking, like in, in, uh, California or Oregon, everything was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could just hang out on the side of the road and you're like in a beautiful forest or something, nah. you know, like, but then there's, you know, parts of the country where it's just a little more dull. Um, yeah. And so, so I, you know, I definitely got to a point where I was like, all right, you know, this isn't really doing it anymore. Right, right. It ran <laughs> uh, its course. Yeah. yeah. And so then I, I passed through Boston, which I initially wasn't even going to, I think I was just going to try to go to Maine and like mm. go to Canada and, nice. and do that. But um, I ended up going because I was like, well, you know, Thoreau was a big inspiration so let me go to Boston, and then from there, like, I can go out to Walden Pond and, like, right. see that and, yeah. and camp. And when I did that, the person who picked me up was this, like, old, uh, like, uh, filmmaker mm. person who was making a documentary about the Transcendentalist writers in Concord, mm. like, Thoreau and all that. So he was like, oh, how serendipitous that I picked you up. <laughs> yeah, wow. And so he took me out there, and he had me meet his video editing assistant, um, who was was like my age was studying French horn. Um, his name is uh, Sebastian. He's a yeah. He was a homie. So um, you know he like we pretty quickly became friends. And then he was like, "Yo, I'm getting a house. Like we're moving into a, a house with like a bunch of students. Um, there's like six people, three stories. You could be number seven. There was an attic that was like 300 bucks a month. Wow. So, that's pretty <laughs> got clutch. Cold. Yeah. But, but yeah, so that's how I ended up then in Boston. Wow. And Amazing. that's, so there wasn't really a point where I was like, this needs to end. The opportunity just sort of arose. Right. Like, right. It happened right. naturally in yeah. that way. Yeah. And then I know you got very involved in, in activism in Boston right. too, which kind of uh, segues into um, the other camp, I guess you could say, of, of this discussion, um, yeah. although there's maybe more connections, I might think, mm -hmm. but yeah, so what was that experience getting involved in, in, was it from that house, or was it a different connection that you made that, that had you become involved in, in you know, activism in Boston? 
Yeah, so, um, so it wasn't necessarily from that house. I mean, everybody, you know, all my roommates were, like, I think pretty, like, social justice oriented. And, like, they were all good people. And they all, like, you know, did their, uh, like, they, they did uh, different forms of activism. But what I actually first ended up getting involved in was Food Not Bombs. And I learned about that when I was hitchhiking because, mm. you know, there was, wow. like, a bunch of cool anarchists giving out free food and I was like oh dope what's what's this all about wow and so then that was, was in the Boston area or totally somewhere completely different because I know they have various presences across the states yeah no so they just have different chapters in different cities right. so yeah. I just but I was familiar with the concept and actually like when I was hitchhiking I stayed at some like anarchist co-ops and 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 stuff like that nice and and some of them did food not bombs. So so I had already had experience. Like I, I got involved that way. And then um I was trying to look for it in Boston, but I didn't really know where to start. And uh I wasn't that tech savvy. And then one of my friends was just like, Yeah, they have a Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just sent me there. And so so that's how I <laughs> got involved. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's funny, just a, a quick side note, I, I just had a similar kind of experience where like, I wasn't on Instagram for the longest time, and I just mm-hmm. felt so, like, some of these, like, underground spots and stuff were just, like, so, like, unattainable to me, yeah, yeah. but then, like, once I got an Instagram, it's just, like, everything's yeah. there, <laughs> Right. post yeah. everything, so yeah. you can just, like, DM them, and then you're good. But, right, exactly, um, yeah. Anyway, though, yeah, continue. Well, yeah, so, so you know, that's how, that's how I got um, into, into that stuff, and, you know, I... At the time, I, I was uh, an anarchist, and there was a couple, you know, reasons it appealed to me. Like it was, they were serving vegan food, mm. and I'm vegan. Um, there, it was about like food justice, and you know, making sure like nothing went to waste. Mm. Um, and and you know, it was also like tying it into the larger issue of, of capitalism, it, it, you know, there was a discussion of course about how like this, this waste is, is not necessary, you know, and it, this is kind of a side thing, but you know, we even saw like, especially during COVID where grocery stores would be throwing away spoiled food and they'd have cops like guarding the dumpsters yeah. and like some crazy, yeah, like, <laughs> so, you know, um, It's, you know, capitalism, it's, it, it, it's not trying to provide for people. Like, that's not its goal, <laughs> you know? And if there's a way for it to make a profit, it's, it's, it's going to do that. And to also, you know, preserve uh, uh, the, I guess, the, the price of the commodity, like food, you know, in the, in the cases of, like, cops guarding grocery store dumpsters, like they would rather let people starve, they as in the capitalist class <laughs> would rather let people starve than you know their commodity go down in value. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's the same with houses too. There's more exactly. at vacant houses than than houseless people, but right. they would never give it to them because they don't make anything. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because it's so much more profitable to just hold on to it for a while until property prices go up, and then you could rent it out for way more. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so you know, that, that was my initial introduction. That kind of got me hip to that stuff. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's a really uh, cool form of mutual aid, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as I got deeper and deeper, I was like, okay, you know, like, this is, this is dope. This is awesome. It's necessary work. But, um, you know, it also goes deeper than that because, like, you know, giving out free food isn't going to, like, weaken capital. Right, you know? right, <laughs> so, right, right, right. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, well, that's the, the, the balance and, and the struggle that I've seen from a lot of these organizing groups is that you put so much energy into the day-to-day, you know, that you don't have time to, to theorize or organize towards, you know, the large picture right. and organizing towards some, you know, actual, like, change, you know what I right. mean? Like, it's kind of like... It's like you have to plug the 
the hole while you're still like building a new part of the ship right. or something. Yeah, so, definitely. And I feel like it's hard to, it's really difficult to find that balance. I feel like, um, definitely. but, but speaking about those kind of forms of thoughts like anarchy and I know, um, now you've, uh, you ascribe more to Marxist Leninist yeah. thought, yeah. right? Yeah. So just curious, like, how did that develop for you through your life? Was it something that you always kind of just felt like, like you had this perspective that the system wasn't working or was there a certain person or text that kind of like opened you up to that way of thinking? Cause you're very mm -hmm. like well read from the times that we've, that we've discussed about these things. So, mm -hmm. so I'm just, thanks. I guess curious, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm just curious like how that, you know, how that came to be, where that yeah. passion kind of started basically similar to, I guess the music story, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, so I'm not sure that he would love to hear this, but the same cousin that gave me, Thoreau and, and Kerouac. It was the same person. Mm. And in the back of Walden was his little essay, Civil Disobedience. So that was the first anarchist text mm. I read. Um, before that, though, you know, I had a very, very vague conception of, like, well, obviously, you know, being dominated and exploited sucks having, you know, seeing that done to, to other people in different parts of the world or here is sucks. Yeah. And, and I at least had a conception that, you know, capitalism or just like a, a system where it rewards acting exclusively in your own self-interest mm -hmm. or in your own self-interest to the detriment of others. Right. <laughs> it's like that cannot possibly ever provide us with any sort of liberation from from domination it can't solve issues of climate change it can't you know and and even with like like green capitalism or eco-friendly products or whatever like you know it's just like you know the the thing is like you're you're making i i i think the underlying philosophy there is like well let's make it profitable to do something good for the environment yeah they're just trying to calm the noise basically because right. people care about it so much so if you right. don't care at all then no one's going to support your corporation right. but right if, if you care enough mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> but still make it you know as right and all the money that you need to make then right and and even you know with with like i, I just think like if um we, we shouldn't be playing a game of appeasement like oh maybe you won't like scorch the earth and make everybody, and, you know, w whatever happens. Right. Maybe you won't do that if we can make it profitable for you mm. to not fuck people over. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, that's already like a, a, a shitty premise to start yeah, from. Yeah, like, exactly. The principle of it is. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, we, we can't just like, cause, cause ultimately like the things that are good for the world are not going to be profitable for private interests. Right. Like, so we can't, we can't operate on that. That's never going to get us, you know, what we need. Right. Well, stuff. case in point for that is, is music and art. Like yeah. I talk about this, I think about this all the time. That's honestly some of the intentionality of, uh, of Miami community radio is just mm -hmm. the lack of respect and value that is placed on art in yeah. modern society, especially Western and, 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 mm -hmm. you know, the States, for yeah. sure there's definitely a lot more support for it with various programs and stuff in 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 europe and everything but mm -hmm. but even so just the system of it you know like it's it's so it's so interesting to me because there's so much intrinsic value to artistic creation yeah. enough intrinsic value that people will like basically choose to suffer for yeah. like the value of it because yeah. there's no, there basically there's a guarantee of nothing <laughs> right if yeah. you pursue this you know of hardship basically if you pursue yeah. this life but it holds so much value that it's still desirable but yeah. it's not recognized by society at all they would rather pay millions to someone that's throwing a ball around which yeah it's cool if you're super athletic i'm not trying to put that down there's also an art to that as well yeah but it's just interesting to me that you know, people playing a game can can bring in billions of profit. It's right. not like the music yeah. isn't making profit, though. It's just that there's yeah. people that are exploiting it, people, right. puppet masters, basically, in place that exploit the art because the art and the artists are so... They don't want to commodify their art, you know what I mean? It's always right. going to be someone yeah. else that commodifies it. Yeah. So it's just like this... 
that to me is really the, 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 like the nail in the coffin of like this system just like does not work. Like yeah, how yeah. can you have all these people that are putting their life into something that's so meaningful and so powerful and heals so many people Yeah, and then they get nothing. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, it reminds me of, of, of like just the issue of like having to commodify and like sell your art. Um, I, I think I, I saw something from Adam Neely mm. who was like, you know, in like every era musicians have a game to play, whether it was like with the churches and box day, or right, right, whether right. it was with link the, up with some King or something, yeah, right. kind of like the, the yeah. minstrel. Yeah. <laughs> or whether it was the record labels, yeah. you know, in the, in the 20th century or then now the algorithm right. <laughs> or like, you know, like social media yeah. and, and, and Spotify and all that. So, it's like there's there's always like somebody we have to appease, and also like somebody we're kind of making art for in a way that's and not like oh we're making art for the community, but like we're making art for this person to, right, <laughs> to get rich. Right, right. Um, so it you know yeah, and I don't think we're gonna get an alternative to to that right. with capitalism. Right. Like, yeah. 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 De- the only the only thing that I perceive that could possibly shift that dynamic is is really within the Web three crypto space. Just the potentials of NFTs. Although, unfortunately, to this stage, they've been co opted as you know things like that do by people that already have the resources and those kind yeah. of people that are just trying to you know flip stuff and make a quick buck. But like the essence of it to me has so much potential in terms of like you own your stuff, like not someone else. It's not like, th- and it's in the blockchain too. So there's no, it's completely emotable. There's literally no way to take it out of it. Like, so that to me is really powerful. And I feel like that could be some kind of subversive force that could potentially destroy um, some aspects of, of the system as it exists now. Of course, they'll try as hard as they can to stop it from doing so, which I feel like we're now in this age where we're going to start seeing a lot more regulations in that regard, especially from the governmental side and IRS trying to catch up with these people who've been able to decentralize their value, you know, through the web three space and not have to rely on, you know, global banks and all the, all the corruption that, uh, that goes along with that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting and and very frustrating situation In, in some ways. You know, not to not to say, oh, the silver lining, because the system needs to be destroyed. Yeah. But, <laughs> but there is, like, I respect those people who still pursue art in face right. of all of those things, because yeah. it means beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's like what you're about. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, or, or or you know, also there might be other other means accessible and other things that make it more conducive to, to you being able to, to make art. Um, you know, I think there's, there's, you know, there's definitely people who, you know, I don't think even have the option to, to be like the suffering or starving artist. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask too about, your veganism, yeah. because of course it's a very large part of your, your identity as well. Yeah. How does that intersectionality inform the way that you move in these various, you know, uh, artistic, progressive, and just life circles? Yeah. Um, well, uh, in terms of artistic circles, uh, I don't think it all does all that much, all right. <laughs> honestly. <laughs> but um, in terms of like progressive circles or or like more more like political spaces um you know there has to be a vegan option whenever i show up right <laughs> not, to, not to not to yeah uh minimize it but um i mean i think that was you know definitely a large part when i was an anarchist and um that tied into the whole non-oppression and not not wanting to dominate any any anyone or any other animal um so it, 
you know, Food Not Bombs was cool because I, I think the chapter I was a part of initially was like strictly vegan. Mm. Um, so at that point, I, you know, felt felt comfortable doing that because I felt like it was, it was, you know, I wasn't compromising on uh, veganism and, you know, I, I didn't necessarily want to cook or serve meat or, you know, have any animal have to die. Right. Um, but, you know, I also didn't want to, like, join PETA or some shit. So, <laughs> uh, or, or do that whole NGO thing, which, right, yeah, right, right. You know, was, would not be in line with m- my ideals uh, right. polit- politically. Like, all it really does is the, <laughs> all it really hits is the vegan aspect. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think, honestly, it's become less and less of an important thing as I've, Learn more, experience more, engaged in more forms of uh, activism or organizing, where I've not not that it's on the back burner, but like I don't think it's the most pressing thing. And mm. you know, going back to uh, like capitalism being an issue as a whole, like I I don't think as long as there's a, a profit motive, as long as it's it can be profitable to have factory farming, like, that's not going to get fixed. Right. So just in terms of, like, the order of things that mm. need to be fixed, like, I think that's one of the later Right, right. Later things. I would tend to agree. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so at this point, I wouldn't say I really... I don't want to say I don't do anything around veganism or, or animal rights activism, but... Uh, but definitely not not as much not as much in the the yeah. forefront of everything yeah. yeah and i yeah i i feel like that decision is 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 ultimately for the best i, yeah. I feel kind of the same way about it as well mm-hmm. just curious um how did things develop from your earlier connection more specifically to anarchism and then now you know yeah. uh, feeling as though you you connect more with uh, marxist and leninist schools of thoughts how did that yeah. transition occur um well you know reading marx was <laughs> was probably the first <laughs> that'll, one that'll do it um <laughs> but uh i mean i think you know in in doing mutual aid stuff like with with anarchist organizations um i think i felt the practice I felt like there was more that I needed to be doing. Mm. Um, and so just as I was looking for, for other things, other answers, other, you know, methods for organizing or social change, like I, I, I felt like I kind of, you know, I don't want to disparage any of my anarchist comrades. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to say like, Right. Well, they, not trying to shit on anarchism. Yeah. But, um, there's more infighting than there should be, in my opinion. Right. I feel yeah. like there's more connections than some might think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And so, um, so ultimately, you know, my my pr- priority is is with the stage we're at. You know, I think, yeah, anarchists, Marxists, uh, you know, uh, whoever else all the other like flavors of yeah, yeah. Trotsky, I don't know how it's <laughs> like, um, all the other flavors of the left. Like we, yeah. <laughs> I think where we're at now, we definitely all need to be. Have unity. Yeah. Yeah, have yeah unity exactly. For sure. Um, yeah. but so, so I think, you know, that transition definitely started from the work I was doing, kind of feeling burnt out in, in this activist. Yeah. Loop. The direct action. Yeah. Yeah. You know, without working towards something bigger. Yeah. Right. Where it, it feels like, we're just putting holes on, right. on the leaks or no, we're just patching the holes. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Um, and yeah. so, yeah. So feeling like it wasn't connected to something larger and that we, that what was necessary was something more, I guess a little more centralized. Mm. Um, and, and not that there's no centralization with the anarchism, but um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, it's I, built I, into it for it to be less inclined towards that. I feel right. like, yeah, and I, and I think it has its limitations. And if we look at like, you know, past revolutions and stuff, like I don't see as many anarchist ones that are able to sustain themselves. Right. Um, and this is where I'm like, I'm not trying to shit on my anarchist comrades, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I, I yeah. Just because, you know, w- with any revolution, like, you 
you see, especially the U.S., is is gonna be like at the border of that country yeah. with with the <laughs> army, like ready to do a coup. Yeah, oh, easily. Yeah. yeah, and so so you know, like that with global capitalism, like being a thing, we know that like that's gonna come with with any revolution, um, and it's a little hard to defend the revolution if you're that decentralized. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah. True. Very true. Yeah. So, so just, it led me here. We're, we're nearing the end of the program. Mm -hmm. So probably I'd love to reconvene with you to totally, continue yeah. this discussion. Yeah. Um, but just to, to, to mention it, cause it's a, mm -hmm. something that you're involved with now, this, this, um, movement, one struggle within Florida, I guess, if you just wanted to speak on that mm -hmm. a bit, cause I know unity, this idea that we just touched on is, mm -hmm. is something that they're, um, working towards very right. tangibly within, within South Florida. So yeah, I'm just totally. curious for kind of yeah, yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah. Right. So, so, so i yeah, I know the, the one struggle people and I've definitely, uh, like gone to a few of their events and, and, and whatnot. Um, and I would say I, um, have a high level of unity with them. Um, you know, so I think, yeah, you know, part of, if I were to, to attempt to explain um, their emphasis on unity and, and, and why, why that is a big priority is, um, well, this isn't maybe the full answer, and I don't know, you know, like what, what they would say. I definitely don't want to misrepresent them. Right. But, um, but my take <laughs> on, on their line <laughs> is uh, them is, you know, for, for any of these, changes to occur, we have to have organization, mm. right? Um, you know, if, just to give an example, like if it was a workplace struggle, like you have to have, you have to organize your workplace, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to, to do really like that organization, like so much of it, it's talking to people, building relationships and getting on the same page about shit so mm -hmm. that you know if, if some sort of, action occurs like let's say a strike people are going to flake out and that is likely you're going to have a percentage of people you know just in the context of a, of, of, of course a strike yeah or, or forming a union or whatever like you're going to have a certain percentage that that flake and right and and you know i think that should be expected that's that's part of your organizing is you have to know that that's going to yeah, happen yeah, exactly but, um but yeah so you know Part of the way to to combat that is is building unity so that everybody is recognizing the same problem is aware of how entrenched it is and is aware of which alternatives are kind of bullshit mm. um, because you know there's there's different factions of the capitalist class they are not necessarily always like in solidarity with each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna offer different alternatives. Like you're gonna have, you know, green capitalists. Right, right. <laughs> you're gonna have, I don't know, the CEO of Lush or some shit, like <laughs> uh, offering a specific alternative, being like soap will save the world, uh, or you know, whatever Lush does, I don't know. But um, <laughs> like, you know, so, so you're gonna have sections of the capitalist class that maybe agree with you up until a point like, hey, yeah, this is an issue. And then they're going to sell you some bullshit that's ultimately going to feed back into capitalism mm -hmm. or electoralism or whatever it is. Um, so developing unity on what the problem is, what the alternatives it might present, and, and how alternatives might feed back into capitalism um, is, is important for making sure that any sort of movement we have doesn't get sucked up into that, doesn't become like the left wing of the Democratic Party. Right. I'm, I'm definitely gonna talk some shit, doesn't become like the DSA and yeah. like, <laughs> you know, the whole squad. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Super important. Yeah. Super, and, uh, yeah, I, we'll have to expand on this discussion yeah. later yeah. for sure. We'll, we'll find a time to, to reconvene. Yeah, <laughs> that's very. It's very interesting and very important uh, to, to be talked about as well um, yeah. and to 
share with other people. Um, so yeah, thanks yeah. so much for, yeah, of course. for Thank coming you so sharing much for your, your, yeah, it was a great honor. <laughs> I was looking forward to it for a while. So I'm glad that we yeah. could, that we could manifest it. Thanks for sharing your music, uh, and your perspective and some of your story and, um, your, um, philosophy and everything. It's, it's uh, very insightful and I will definitely be reviewing the video myself. So <laughs> to anyone on the stream, it's going to be on our cool. YouTube, Miami community radio. You can check it out. Um, in the next week or so it will be uploaded. Um, yeah, thanks again from the musical portion to the engineering from Isaac Diskin. Uh, wonderful job as always. Um, thanks so much to the MCR team for making this happen. I'm Goon Green. Uh, this is The Pocket, the third rendition of this new chapter of the show, highlighting some local musicians and minds um, within the South Florida area. I brought on Simon Silva and then brought on Aiden Finn and Benaya. Uh, last and now Matt Tufaro here uh, this uh, afternoon now early evening uh, coming up next Red Planet Radio with uh, Marte and then Dust Collective and then Teeter closing out the stream for us here at MCR um, so any closing thoughts um, no just thank you so much for having me it was an honor and I really enjoyed it thanks same here thanks so much to everyone Goon Green The Pocket signing off <laughs>